Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So grateful for the opportunity that you've given us to just feast upon your word, just the privilege of holding in our hands your word. I ask that you would teach us, guide us, instruct us, filter out all of the foolishness, but seal to our hearts that which is truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been studying in the first epistle of John, and in our last study together, we looked at, we were looking at the love of God, uh, which was carried quite heavily in the fourth chapter, uh, ending the fourth chapter, and now we're, we're being introduced to the fifth chapter. So I guess we're at chapter five, verse one. But this is one of those cases where that the chapter division seems to disrupt the thought. And I've pointed out in several of our studies in the past that, that uh, chapter and verse divisions are very, they're very valuable for telling you where we're at in, in the Word of God so that you know where I'm, you can easily find where I'm, where I'm referring, the location that I'm referring to. But sometimes they seem to be in the most inappropriate locations, and, and although the location really shouldn't make any difference, they're, they're only there as markers so that I can tell you that we're in the first epistle of John, chapter 5, verse 1. If we look back at the last couple of verses, if a man says he loves God and doesn't love his brother, he's a liar. He knows what he's saying can't be true. You can't love God and not love the brother. And, and that theme is going to be developed in the, in the first several verses of chapter 5. Uh, I, I think I pointed out how that there were like 28 references uh, uh, of to the word of the word love the in in uh, uh so many number of verses there were just uh, it's more constant it seems to be at least more concentrated here than in in any other place that i've found in the new testament where that we're looking at the love of god and the love that we have you know for one another and that continues to carry over into chapter five but there were no chapter divisions in the original text so uh, the chapter division shouldn't lead us to believe that we have another subject in view is what I'm saying. So where we left, uh, we, we left where that he's saying something that can't be true. If you love God, you love the brethren, and that, that'll be developed as we, as we move forward in our study here. If he doesn't love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God, whom he's not seen. In fact, we have an exhortation from the Father that he who loves God loves his brother. Also, all who believe that Jesus is the Christ have been born of God. Have been born of God. And we don't want that chapter division to disrupt the train of thought. All who are believing that Jesus is the Christ. And folks, that's doctrine. That's theology. You know, there's far too many people who say, you know, might, they just say just a simple testimony of your love for Christ. You know, that's all you need. And, and if you don't have any doctrine behind it, I don't know whether you're, you know, loving a Jesus of the Muslims, a, a, a Jesus of the Jehovah Witnesses, uh, a Jesus of the Roman Catholics or or anybody else I need to know and you need to know more than I do I need to know for myself that the Jesus who is the Christ is the one uh, of the Word of God and we we are we hold this to be God's Word uh, inerrant uh, and infallible in the original languages uh, and I emphasize original languages. And we have here the great privilege of holding in our hands the Word of God who spoke the world into existence. And he says that this can't be true in verse 20 
because all who believe that Jesus is the Christ have been born of God. And I've spent some time pointing out the perfect passives in this epistle. There's seven of them in the first epistle of John alone. You know, somebody said to me, you know, look, you know, it says those who received him, he gave power to become the sons of God. And, and, and then that's where they stop. They, and folks, you can't do that. You, you have to finish the sentence. Who were born not of the will, their own will, but by the will of God. And starting at John chapter one, you can go through the scriptures and you can find, you can find a, a, a plethora of verses that indicate that you believe Jesus Christ because you're already his. However, dearly beloved, if you listen to television and you read modern literature, you know that you become Christ by believing, which is exactly opposite of what the scriptures say. And we put a guilt complex on people. You know, if you would just do that or this, that, or the other thing. And even those Reformed pastors who know full well, they, they, are, they fully realize that no man can come unto the Father except it be given him of the Father. If I be lifted up, I will drag all men unto me. And there's always the force of the sovereign God. And even those who believe that have to be very cautious. You know, they'll give us a message and then uh, and they'll, they'll talk about all these wonderful grace truths can, that surround grace. And then they always end in the last two minutes. Now, if you will do something, if you'd accept Christ or believe this, God will give you new life. And folks, I can't say that. This book says if you don't have new life, you can't believe. John chapter 10, why don't you believe me because you're not my sheep? It couldn't be any, any simpler than that. You cannot find a single verse of scripture that says that you are redeemed by accepting Christ. You can't find a single passage of scripture that says that you're born again by accepting Christ. Where, where can you find any passage of Scripture that says that you're born again by accepting Christ? Or that you're made righteous by accepting Christ? Dear friends, this book clearly states that you are reconciled to God by His death. You're made righteous by His obedience, and you received Him because... Because you were already born from God. You were born from God. You know, we call that born again. You know, I prefer born from above. I guess maybe I'm just, a little, you know, it's because I just love the sound of that. But that's our word in verse 1. All who believe that Jesus is the Christ. My Bible says, is born of God. How do you translate it? Because it is a perfect passive. It means he had nothing to do with it. All of those believing had nothing to do with that birth. That's why it's a passive voice. Now you Greek students, you understand this. There had to be an operator other than themselves. The perfect passive says that it is a past time accomplishment and there's nothing left to be done. It's completely done. Now, there are those who believe that the perfect tense should be taken in, in the sense of the time of the writer. And uh, there, are, there are a number of passages of Scripture where that, that doesn't work. And this is one of them. All who believe, or all who are believing, it's a, it's a present tense, okay? Those who are believing that Jesus is the Christ have been born of God. The reason the authorized version says is born of God is because the perfect tense stresses the present reality of the past action. So, so to stress the present reality, they put it in the present tense, is born of God. 
the evidence is clear that he's born of God. You couldn't possibly make that verse say, all who are believing in Christ you know, will be born of God. Or if you believe in Christ, you will be born of God. You can't do that. You can't do that. All who presently believe that Jesus is the Christ were in past time all born of God. That's what the perfect tense is saying. And they had nothing to do with it. They're not his because they believe. They're not born from God or, or by God because they believe. They believe because they're born from God. I, th I think I've talked about this a number of times. The uh, uh, modern theology since the late 1800s has reversed that marvelous revelation of grace. It's not grace, folks, if you have to do something. And, and I am not going to tell you or anyone that they have to do something to be born of God. You know, I might ask you, you know, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ? And if you say yes, well, I don't know whether you fulfill the tenets of that verse or not. I don't know how to tell you to believe. I don't know how to tell you to accept. You know, uh, apparently a lot of ministers know how to do that. I don't. You know, it seems like they just, they have this overwhelming desire to, to get some reaction why do I have to do that? Dearly beloved, it is not my business. God didn't send me to identify, okay, but to preach the gospel. If you believe that Jesus is the Christ, it is because you were born from above. And if you're born from above, you're a believer. If you're born from above by God, you're a believer, and that's a point that many can't seem to understand. Folks, if you are in darkest Africa and never see a missionary as long as you live, and you were born from above, you're a believer. All right? You may never exercise that belief because you didn't know what to believe, but you're a believer. And my job is not to try to put some sense of guilt on you to scare you into heaven. You know, there, there's two sides, uh, dramatically opposed. There's, there's the side that, that uh, exhorts you to be wealthy, happy, satisfied. And if you're not, well, there's some, something wrong with you. There's, there's some sin in your life. And man, God wants you to be rich. You know, and then there's the other side. The other side that tries their best to, to scare you, to frighten you and to load you down with guilt until you come and accept Christ. No man can come unto me unless it has been granted him of my Father. Of course he forced us to spend eternity with him. You know, I've had people say, well, God doesn't force us to do anything. Folks, if he had not forced us, we would have all died in our sins. I, and I cannot make you come to Christ. I can't present Christ in any way that would lead you to come to him and to believe on him for eternal life. If you have e e if eternal life, if you've been born of God, you will believe. I practically on this channel, in this ministry, I practically worn out that, that phrase, putting the cart before the horse. But that, folks, that is exactly what has been done. And it is our enemy, Satan, who has done that. Of course he forced you, okay, to come to him. Because... He died in your place while you weren't seeking him, while you weren't loving him. In fact, while you were his enemy, he died in your place. So I can't present Christ in any way that would lead you to come to Christ and to believe on him for eternal life. Everyone that loves him has been born of God. Everyone that loves him. 
And that's God who brought them to life. He begat them. Perfect passive. And now we, we go to seminary, and we, have, we hear the professor say, well, now I don't want you, you all to get the wrong idea. There aren't, there aren't really people walking around. There are not any people walking around the earth who've been born again, but don't, they don't know it yet. This, that becomes effective when they believe. Well, if that is what it says, you have to convince me of that. I don't know where people get the idea that they're his sheep only if, if I see some evidence that they're his sheep. And if I see no evidence of that, I can't, well, I can't know that they're his sheep. That if they don't believe that they're not his sheep, I say if they're his sheep, they're a believer. They may not have exercised faith yet, like Paul, okay? Before he believed on the road to Damascus, Paul was a child of God. Christ died in Paul's place before his conversion on the road to Damascus. He was a believer, but he wasn't believing. Okay? Every last one of us lived at some point as his children in a state of unbelief. Folks, the fact that you're the, the fact that you're a thief in no way implies that you steal all the time, okay? The fact that you're a murderer in no way infers that you murder all the time. And the fact that you're a believer in no way infers that you believe all the time. Why didn't Moses, a believer, go into the promised land? Because he didn't believe God. Because you did not believe me, you will not take this people into the promised land. Couldn't be any clearer. And dearly beloved, I don't believe that my job is to try to convince you people to become believers. I believe the scriptures say that if you love the one who did the begatting, then you love those whom he begat. And it's all centered. It's all centered in God and the Lord Jesus Christ. How are we born again? Because Jesus Christ died in our place. Because we are made new creations in Christ Jesus. I think one, at least for me personally, and I'm just speaking personally uh, here, that one of the most oh unfortunate things for me as far as, as this ministry goes and all of you uh, precious souls out there for whom Christ died, we can't gather together physically together for the Lord's Supper. It's kind of hard to hold communion. I guess I suppose that could be arranged. It could be done. You know, we wouldn't be in one another's presence, but we could do that. But, but we gather for the Lord's Supper, a memorial service of what Christ has done for us. You know, and we read, well, you know, if, if you don't eat his flesh and drink his blood, you're none of his. And from that time on, you know, especially, you, you know, uh, most, most of, uh, well, if you read the Greek, most of his disciples went back and, and walked no more with him. And because of that, there's the belief that in the Lord's Supper, the elements actually become the, the actual body and, uh, and actual blood of Christ. And so he sacrificed over and over again. Today, this very day, Jesus Christ will be re-sacrificed all over the world thousands of times. And the reformers realized that that wasn't true. And they came up with a couple of other ideas. And, and I'm not going to uh, spend your, your time on those ideas. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you that this is simply... A physical memorial of our life with Christ. I, I believe personally, if you're talking about the Lord's Supper or the, or the communion service, I believe it occurs every time a group of people gather together around this book. This word is his blood and his flesh. It's our nourishment, dearly beloved. It's our life. And every time we gather around this book and we look at it seriously, we are dealing with Jesus Christ and Him crucified. 
I determined to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Jesus Christ and Him crucified is this book. That's what we have. And what His people gather together to do is simply a physical manifestation of that. The bread's not the actual body of Christ. The wine's not the actual blood of Christ. It's simply a picture of how we live. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16, The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the of the body of Christ for we being many are one bread and one body and we are all we are all partakers of that one bread that's us every time we gather together in communion we are partaking of the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ in our place all scripture exalts Christ I don't know why Christians today seem to find it so offensive. What shall we say then? Is there, is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that shows mercy. Romans chapter 9. There is about a there's about a 95% chance that your Christian friends regard those th those verses there in Romans 9 as as trash. You know I read I read a comment from a viewer, you know, uh, a new thing to me. I have two of my siblings they're they're sending me, you know, anti uh, uh, Calvin booklets, you know, they think I've lost it. And and I, I noticed how that, that many of my friends had just clicked, you know, a little teary eyed, teary faced, smiley faces, you know, crying, you know, isn't that so awful? Folks, that's nothing to be sad about. Praise God for that and let that divinely engineered circumstance do its work. You're blessed. If you're persecuted for his sake. An incalculable number of Christians are attending church, desiring to be fed. That's what they want. That's why they go. That's they only to walk away weakened and more hungry than ever. That condition was foreseen by our Lord. An instruction was given by him to feed my lambs, shepherd my sheep. Feed my sheep, that's, that's John 21. That, that condition is inexcusable for any church, any ministry, any organization today. The emphasis of this ministry, blessed hope forever, is on the fellowship that we have with God and one another around the truth of God's Word. If that's what you seek, that's, that's, then welcome to blessed hope forever because that's our interest here. There are countless others who serve God out of a sense of commitment, obligation, guilt. You know, that may seem like a commendable motive, folks, but it is not. Compulsion is the very heart of the law. Law brings death. The only motive for our involvement in one another's lives should be the response of life seeking other life. Our life seeking other believers to mutually edify, to share, to receive, and to return praise and worship to the source of life himself. If your heart is drawn to the beauty of Christ and what he has done for us, if that's where your heart is, I'm eternally grateful for your fellowship and for, and for your friendship. Many Christians consider it to be their God-given duty, you know, to serve as referees or, or umpires over one another. I, want nothing, I don't want anything to do with that. The only person officially appointed to settle the dispute, folks, is the Holy Spirit of God, and that through 
this book. I've cautioned people not to always just believe, accept something that I say to be true as if that was the truth. You Folks, you have to search the Scriptures daily. You have to examine what is said here in light of Scripture to see if it's true or not. It, it is... It ranks up there as being one of my greatest interests to encourage you people to spend more time in this book. Guilt is never from God. There's only one who accuses us, dearly beloved, of being guilty, and that's the accuser himself, Satan. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you're one of those hurting Christians out there who's despondent, who's confused, who's upset, uncertain, if you've been, if you feel that you've been misled, that you've been lied to, that you've been abused, spiritually abused, if you feel that God's approval of you is based upon your performance when our only approval is from God because we're accepted in the Beloved, That was Ephesians chapter 1. Then we have fellowship with one another. Blessed hope forever, forever is not some place where the teachings of Jesus are hurled at you as though that you are an enemy of God, where you are endlessly indicted for your failure to live up to all that the Bible said that you got to do to enter into His kingdom. Blessed hope forever is a place of fellowship with Christ Jesus and it, as its focus. Nothing else. If that's what you find comfort in, then we have fellowship with one another. But don't lie to yourself and to others. Don't lie against the truth. Take seriously to heart what this book says. Even if you don't understand it, these are vitally important matters that deal with the issue of life and death, folks. And we were told to test the spirits, whether they be of God. I want to take a moment. I want to take a moment to just thank you all for all of your your love, your support, your your feedback, your comments, your involvement in my life and in the lives of others who are associated with this ministry. I know that there's a lot of people hurting. I know that there's still a lot of people that are confused. I know that there's a lot of people out there that are, are suffering through various circumstances that God designed specifically for your growth in grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. I just want you all to know that I pray for you all constantly and that I love you all dearly. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.